good afternoon, everyone, uh, both uh, in present and online. Uh, my name is Mark Howden. I'm the director of the ANU Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions, uh, and welcome everyone to ANU. So today uh, we've got a, um, our annual energy update. Uh, this is one of a series of events. Uh, today we're focusing on uh, the pathway to net zero. Now, of course, this is an incredibly topical sort of issue at the moment. Uh, obviously, it was a high profile element of the recent Glasgow Conference of Parties. Uh, it's, uh, it's been signed onto, net zero by 2050, been signed onto by something like 140 countries across the globe. Uh, and Australia, unfortunately, is very late to that party, but at least we do have uh, a sign-on to that target. Uh, and we see businesses right across the globe and here in Australia also signing on to net zero. And as well, we have a situation where something like 80% of Australians, when surveyed, actually say that they want Australia to have a net zero target. So. The fact is that we've actually got incredible momentum here, and so, so the sort of issues which are being talked about today, I think, are extraordinarily topical. So before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on who we meet, that's the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and to acknowledge their continuing contribution to the life of Australia. Just in terms of uh, logistics, um, before we begin the presentations, um, the Q&A session tonight, because of COVID restrictions and microphones, will largely be done over the VVOX platform. So there should be VVOX uh, um, uh, information up there. It should have been on an email you received um, and also on the event registration page if you want to access it there. So um, we will potentially just take uh, questions from the floor, uh, but not with microphones. So um, if you, we take a question from the floor, you'll have to speak up so that we can hear you properly. And I'll repeat it for the um, participants online. So just to kick off our first speaker, uh, it's uh, Professor Frank Yotso. Frank is probably well known to many of you. Um, Frank's a professor at the ANU Crawford School, um, where he directs the Centre for Climate and Energy Policy. He's also the head of energy at the Institute of Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions. Uh, that's an, in an inaugural, inaugural position that he has there. So he's the, the first um, head in that role. Uh, Frank's research focuses particularly on policy for climate change and energy uh, in the context of economic reform and development. He is also a very uh, regular uh, commentator um, in the news and uh, briefing a whole range of different entities in relation to these issues. So he's out there uh, trying to uh, encourage action, effective action on these topics. Uh, his global standing is demonstrated by his leader authorship in the IPCC. So he was a, a lead author in, in the fifth assessment report and now in the sixth assessment report. And he's also part of the core writing team for the synthesis report in this IPCC cycle. Welcome, Frank. Yeah, so uh, colleagues, friends, visitors, participants, uh, welcome. Thanks for coming. It's very exciting for all of us to be able to do an event like this actually in person. Uh, and as you, as you can see, we've been practicing COVID normal, uh, which means uh, hybrid events. Uh, we've got a large online audience, a large online participation. And of course, this event uh, is also being recorded and will be available uh, on, on the web uh, later on. So I won't keep you for long because we've got um, an, an amazing array of, uh, of speakers lined up today um, and I really don't want to, to keep you for too long. Um, what I do want to do uh, is, is take a quarter of an hour max uh, to run through you know, what's been happening in energy in 2021, okay? So here's my challenge. I don't think I will, I will be able to properly meet it, but um, let me highlight a few things that I think are worth um, uh, keeping in mind. First of all, uh, you've probably seen uh, the program. We've got three sessions for this uh, energy update, followed by the solar oration. Um, uh, this session will focus on decarbonization uh, trajectories, Australia and the US in particular. Um, second session will be on zero emissions industry, uh, and a third session of the energy update will be on Australia's energy transition action and research uh, agenda. That's the plan for today and then the solar oration at, uh, at 5.30. Um, so first of all, how do we get to net zero? Everyone's talking about net zero. Most countries, most developed 
countries have taken on net zero emissions targets, commitments, pledges. How do you do this? Well, at the heart of it is a zero emissions electricity supply. Then you electrify everything. Then you do bits and pieces, process and product changes throughout industry, agriculture, uh, and other parts of the economy. Then you remain, then you've got some emissions remaining and you will be compensating for them uh, through carbon dioxide uptake, uh, either biologically uh, or technically, right? Um, so it's really quite straightforward in that sense, but of course it is um, one of the massive economic and in many ways social endeavors of this century. Um, Looking at the IEA net zero scenario, quite a landmark report by the International Energy Agency. Um, where is the action coming from in terms of that shift to net zero in the energy sector? Well, uh, you've got activity levels still driving emissions up, right? So we're gonna see more economic activity, um, but then you've got many, many things driving emissions down, close to zero, in fact, in that scenario. Mostly it's a, uh, a complete transition of electricity to clean electricity, mostly renewables, but also some nuclear in there, potentially some CCS. Um, and then very many changes in industrial systems, in transport systems, uh, in, in, uh, in residential and business buildings and so forth. Very importantly, right, what this means is a massive tidal wave of investment, okay? That's required to do this. Um, and that in many ways changes the economic thinking about this, right? So we've got, uh, we're living in a period of capital availability, extremely low interest rates, um, with a lot of capital everywhere, seeking productive use and not asking for very high returns. And so a massive global project like decarbonization uh, is, is the perfect opportunity to deploy that capital for future productivity. And you see that notion increasingly being reflected uh, by the IMF and reflected um, in, the, uh, in the analysis of international agencies like the IEA as well. How quickly will fossil fuels be uh, displaced? And so this is a field where we see dramatically different scenarios and dramatically different worldviews by different people, different companies, different organizations, right? It could be really fast. If you're, if you're serious about net zero, then you're looking at the, at the bottom most trajectories here. These are just the illustrative scenarios by the IEA, right? Um, if you're believing that uh, everything will just keep on going uh, according to current policy settings in place and no dramatic technological change, then you're more towards the, op the upper end of that scenario range. But the point here is, right, there is great uncertainty about where this journey is going, right? From, you know, modest continued growth in some of these fossil fuels, especially gas, right, to dramatic declines uh, just around the corner, okay? Um, what have we seen in actual fact in terms of global energy supply? Well, very, very rapid rise in renewables, especially solar, really amazing growth rates in deployment, while at the same time, there's a fundamental persistence of fossil fuels, okay? So that, in a nutshell, is the picture that we've seen. Um, coal, coal is on, in, on the decline, okay? And uh, in particular, in power use, mm -hmm. right? And so many countries, coal phase out, or not just phase down, as the Glasgow Pact uh, uh, language, but phase out is underway. What you see on the left is a projection for European coal use in, in power sector. Uh, so you, you're getting down to very, very low levels by, by about 2030. It, more interesting in many ways, of course, what's happening in developing countries. And India is a particularly uh, interesting case there. We're really on the verge of solar being cheaper than coal in India. Okay, um, and not too far away from solar plus battery storage being on cost parity with new coal in India. Okay, and so once you see these thresholds um, uh, crossed, uh, change can be very, very rapid indeed. What does the investment tell us? Okay, so in the power sector, the very large bulk of global investment is going into renewables at this point in time already. Overall, we still see very large investments going in in upstream and midstream uh, fossil fuels, in particular um, oil and gas. At the same time, we're seeing really, really ex exponential, well, very high growth rates uh, in new technologies like battery technologies, um, like uh, uh, hydrogen production through, uh, through electrolysis, right? So from a very small base, but very, very large uh, growth rates. Moving on to Australia, where are we at? Well, around about 20% emissions reductions relative to base year 2005. Um, almost the entirety of these emissions reductions from land use change in forestry. 
2030 emissions target remains at 26 to 28, but with a strong statement about the expectation of emissions reductions up to 35%. That's the current uh, state of play. Uh, electricity emissions have been reducing every year since 2016, but really no movement anywhere else in the economy. And what that means is massive unused opportunity for a little bit of sensible, sensible policy to actually drive quite substantial emission reductions. And this is what we can absolutely see happen over the remainder of this decade. Um, and so uh, emission reductions far greater than the 35% um, uh, foreshadowed. Um, could readily be possible with, if, if the right effort is made. And we'll hear about the US uh, from Professor Leon Clark in just a minute, where the emissions target is now, of course, 50% uh, for 2030. Projections and analysis. Okay, so if you take a look at the recently released um, model, modeling analysis behind the, the so-called plan for, uh, for net zero, um, you see an example of, of, of projected persistence, okay? So coal kind of fades out, right? 50% reduction in coal, uh, coal uh, value by 2050 projected, but, but gas is still there. In fact, gas is growing. Um, and, uh, and, and somewhat remarkably in these numbers, gas even grows in electricity supply in the net zero scenario here. Extremely slow uh, take up of electric vehicles. And so that's why I'm saying that there's an enormous upside there in terms of what might actually happen and is, you know, in my view, uh, likely to happen compared to the analysis that's still out there. Okay. Technology targets, of course, um, important to recognize decarbonization really fundamentally relies on the deployment of new zero carbon technologies, right? The point, however, is that most of these technologies are already in existence and what we need is large scale deployment, okay? And so there are some technologies that still need fundamental advancement or that still need, you know, invention. Um, uh, and absolutely it's the right thing to invest in that, but we cannot only do that. And as a relatively small country, we of course need to uh, choose our battles and need to be sure that we choose the kinds of technologies for support where as a relatively small economy, we can really make a global uh, difference. Uh, Australia's energy transition, I'd like to point you to a report um, that's, uh, that's coming out um, probably on Friday we'll release it. It will be the ANU Australia Energy Emissions Monitor uh, produced uh, by Dr. Hugh Sadler. Um, and, uh, and so that will be a bi-monthly update on energy and electricity sector developments in Australia. Um, headlines here, um, much more wind and solar, less coal, less gas, of course. Um, one number I want to leave you with, and that is the emissions intensity of electricity supply, right, reduced by 25, by 20% over five years, okay? So that's, an, that's actually an enormous annual rate of emissions intensity reduction in electricity supply that's pointing absolutely in the right direction. Storage, just one of many things, um, rapidly, rapidly becoming uh, cheaper. 90% reduction in battery uh, costs over a decade or whatever it might be. Uh, decentralized energy storage, including in batteries, likely to take a very important role in the Australian electricity system um, in, in years to come. Um, and of course, uh, our colleagues from the Battery Storage and Grid Integration Program doing really exciting uh, work um, uh, on that, including on electric vehicle integration, right? So once you all have an electric, if you drive a car, once you've replaced that one with an electric car, you have a massive battery on wheels there. Uh, sitting in your carport, and if we connect only some of them up to the grid, um, a lot of the variability of wind and solar will be uh, taken care of. I've done the hat tip to Hugh Sadler. I'd like to do the hat tip to Ian Cronshaw as well, uh, who at the Energy Update for many, many years has been providing us with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the sneak, um, well, the summary of the IEA uh, en Energy Outlook. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'm finishing up with a little bit of a view into the future, okay? And if you want to have a glimpse of the future, then look at South Australia today, right? Um, so this is, this is the so-called green and gold picture of electricity supply, right? Namely green for wind and gold for, for solar. Uh, this, what you're looking at here is South Australia's electricity generation relative to demand over the last seven days. And over those last seven days, there were very significant periods where the entirety of South Australian electricity demand was fulfilled 
through wind and solar and a few short periods where the entirety of electricity demand was fulfilled by solar. Um, and remarkably, during those periods, when it was 100% renewable energy supply, the share of gas in the system was only about 5 to 6%, right? So we're talking about last week. Um, those 5 to 6% kind of for system stability, essentially, right? Um, and so you can extrapolate that uh, to the entire grid in Australia, more or less, right? Um, and you will see a lot more storage capacity um, alleviating the need for some of that gas in the mix. Okay, so it's very exciting. Um, in the middle of the day, we've seen negative emission, uh, negative energy price, and that's of course the time of day when you charge um, your storage. Okay, um, finishing up on that, great opportunity of course for Australia in all of this, um, because we have such fantastic opportunity for renewable energy uh, generation at very, very large scale, practically unlimited scale, at uh, low cost in global comparison, right? And what that means is that we won't only have a low cost, zero emissions energy supply domestically, we can also use that to build up energy export industries, okay? And so significant part of the work program at ANU uh, under the uh, grand challenge, zero carbon energy for Asia Pacific, is uh, on that. We'll hear more about that in the second session. Um, the potential for exports, renewable-based exports, whether it's direct energy exports, cable, hydrogen, ammonia as carriers, right, or whether it's energy-intensive commodities that are produced here on this continent uh, using uh, solar and wind uh, predominantly. Um, the value added from such industries could be enormous, okay, could potentially uh, eclipse the value added or the total value of uh, fossil fuels <coughs> produced and exported now, okay? That's the promise, that's the opportunity, uh, and in many ways that should probably be the goal, right? Along, of course, with economic diversification, um, uh, so we're not just a, a, a primary industry and energy provider in terms of that future economic uh, picture. Um, and at the same time, of course, right, what's needed is not only the support of those new emerging energy and energy-based industries, but it is also looking after the parts of the country that have relied very heavily uh, on fossil fuels, right, whether it's production or use of fossil fuels. That is very undoubtedly an issue um, that we collectively as a society uh, will need to come to terms with um, and will need to cushion and facilitate uh, that transition. And that's really uh, the, the, you know, the mainstay of what we'll talk about in the third session of Energy Update. Um, thank you very much. And Mark, would you like to introduce our next speaker? That's right. Um, th thanks very much, Frank, for that uh, really great snapshot of uh, essentially the state of energy uh, and, uh, and what might happen in the future. So um, our next speaker is Professor Leon Clark. Um, so Leon's a research professor at University of Maryland School of Public Policy, and he's also a research director for the Centre of Global Sustainability there. He's uh, also part of the Joint uh, Global Change Research Institute, which is a collaboration between that university and the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in the US. Uh, Leon is an expert in energy and environmental issues with a focus on climate change, uh, climate change emission reduction strategies, energy technology options, and integrated assessment modeling. Uh, Leon was in the fifth assessment report where, amongst other things, he and I worked together on the synthesis report there and is now a co coordinating lead author in the IPCC sixth assessment report. And that report will uh, be approved, hopefully, in March of next year, uh, which we really look forward to. Anyway, welcome, Leon. Move. Uh, I guess I have automatic forwarding, which I will try and <laughs> uh, stop. Um, the new president is moving a range of actions to try and um, try and reduce emissions. Um, and this is what what's listed here is what's in the 550 billion uh, that's in climate in the current reconciliation bill. And I won't go through U.S. politics for those who don't know it, but there's a bill in the Congress. Uh, that would have to be approved by both houses. And if and when it's approved, then there will be a substantial funding for climate. 
Will it be enough to get us down to 50 to 52%? Probably not without act broader actions beyond that. Okay, so let's, that's just sort of a little background of where we are. Um, and, and now let me talk about what's required. So um, this is a chart from one particular study and I'll probably spend some time on this study as I go through the talk, just because it's, um, it, it gets at some of the dimensions that I, want to, that I want to talk about. But this first thing I want to talk about coming out of the study is the nature of the actual emissions reductions that are associated with getting down to 50, 50, 50 to 52% 50 by 2030. Um, and what you can see here on the left is a, a set of, of, of bars showing emissions in 2005, 2019, and then going over to the right in 2030. Now, this is one study. There's been now a number of studies in the US looking at trying to get emissions down into this range and meet the NDC. And they all have some pretty common characteristics. So the main characteristic on almost all of them is you're gonna get most of your emissions reductions or the largest chunk, patiently probably about half of those emissions reductions out of electricity. And that means getting out of coal as quickly as we can, which is already underway in the US, constraining gas, uh, retaining the nuclear fleet as much as possible, um, and then deploying a large amount of renewable, renewable power, which I'll discuss in a moment. Second is going to be transportation. A lot of that's efficiency, but also moving to electric vehicles. And that's something, you know, those two you commonly see across all studies is accounting for somewhere around three quarters of the emissions reductions. But that's not enough. Getting down to 50 to 52% is quite ambitious. And so you actually need to be have to have action across the entire spectrum, buildings, which would be efficiency, electrification, industry, a broad range of different actions. Methane, we can be thinking particularly about oil and gas, but also beyond that. And then the US, for what it's worth, has a very important land use sink. That land use sink is critical for us to be able to constrain our emissions. And particularly as we go down towards net zero, that land use sink will be ex extremely, extremely important. Um, okay, I can hear myself a little bit in the background <laughs> with a delay, but hopefully that won't cause too much trouble. So that's the general outline of what it looks like in the US. And it's, I don't think it's dissimilar. Each country has their own unique characteristics. We still have a decent amount of coal generation. And so that provides us an ability to make some progress simply by moving out of coal. Okay, what does that mean on the ground? What is, let me just say a couple of comments now about the challenges. <laughs> the challenges uh, in terms of the actual physical system. So what you're seeing here is a chart that just came out of the recent release, US long-term strategy. Um, and on the left, it includes historical capacity um, installations in the US up through 2020. You can see back over time, it would have been fossil. There was a real dash to gas in the early 2000s. Over time now, more recently, it's been much more in solar and wind. If you go to the middle chart, what you're seeing, and I want, just wanna focus on the left and the middle. What you're seeing in the middle chart is the average annual investments and or the average and annual capacity additions in electricity that would be needed to be on a 50 to 52% pathway and then getting down towards, towards zero before mid-century. What you see is the capacity additions are on the scale every year of the capacity additions that were at the peak of the dash to gas in the early 2000s in the US. Now that's a little disingenuous in a way because capacity for solar is very different than capacity for gas. They have different capacity factors, but nonetheless, what we're talking about is sustained investment over a decade, and in fact, over three decades, sustained investment um, in, 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 um, in solar and wind power in particular, but in addition, maybe fossil with CCS, potentially nuclear, but substantial capacity additions. Um, and then just to give a little bit more flavor of it, here's some other results that I wanna pull out from some recent studies that we did just as examples. So here's some of the things that you see, I'll read off a couple of these, in electricity, what you're seeing that pretty much you're gonna have by 2050, no electricity generated by coal fired power plants without carbon capture and storage. So it's pretty much gone. 
We talk about renewable power delivering about 50% of electricity. That's quadrupling from today's levels. Now note that still also includes, includes hydropower. Um, on transportation, over 65% of new cars and SUV sales will be electric, and 10% of new truck sales are electric. All in buildings, all new buildings are 100% electric in 2030. That doesn't actually pay dividends in 2030. It really pays dividends going forward, and so on and so forth. So I had this slide up here in the slide before to give you a sense of the scale and the technological challenges or the sort of techno-economic challenge that's associated with making, making progress towards 50 to 52%. And I don't think it's unique to the US. I think it's for all countries have this. And so then the question is, this is doable. The question is, is there a societal mechanism by which this can actually happen? What's the societal structure that will make this happen? What's the political process that will make this actually happen? And returning then to the first part of the this, this presentation where I discuss the back and forth at the federal level, it raises the question of how can the US actually meet these long-term goals when we may have this back and forth at, at, at the federal level. Now, part of that is putting policies in place that are durable, but that's not the only solution. And so now I wanna dive a little bit more into the way we think about progress in the US in a federal system. So the main point I wanna make to start is just that the US is not just the federal government. The US, in fact, is, uh, includes a great deal of power it is devolved to the states, but there's also cities, there's businesses, there's a huge range of actors. And as a, as a matter of where we are, um, the coalition of actors in the US who have committed to meeting the Paris goals actually represents at this point 70% of US gross domestic product, about two thirds of our population and over half of our emissions. And this is really important. And I'll go into that in just a moment. One thing that I've often seen in speaking outside of the US was there's a perception that during the Obama administration, the US was taking tremendous action on climate because frankly, President Obama was quite committed to it. But the reality is that only so much could be done because that, well, he might've been committed to it and the administration might've been committed to it. The Congress was not for six of his eight years, for the final six of his eight years. Then there's a perception that when President Trump was in office, the US wasn't doing anything on climate. That's also not true because during that period, um, states, cities, businesses, civil society, um, which had already been taking action, really were spurred to greater and greater action. And you can see now we have 25 states in the US Climate Alliance, and that's not just states on the coasts. That includes states that are in the middle of the country, some of them in, in the South. So there's really a movement in the US to take action at the subnational level. And I think it's fair to say that without that action over the last four years uh, during the Trump administration, the Biden administration would not be in a position to make a commitment of reaching 50 to 52%. And it's also true that in President Biden's um, making his commitment, he has talked about an all of society approach. So there's a recognition now that this is not just a federal action, but it's, a, it's an all of society action in the US. Um, so I wanna then step back and, and talk a little bit about the contributions and how to think about the contributions of the different actors. So this is from a study that we published in 2019. The results are probably slightly different now, but the basic tenor of it is not. Um, but the, the point I, I wanna make is, is going over to these green bars. So the, the, the blue bars on the left are showing us what emissions were. Uh, the, the red bar is showing an assessment of how much emissions might increase by 2030. No one knows for sure, but it's an assessment. And then the green bars tell us how we get our emissions down. In this case, the emissions got down to 49%. This was before President Biden came into office. But let's just concentrate on the two bars that are circled here. The first, blue, first green bar shows that we actually get, just in current measures, what's currently on the books at the federal level, but also at the state level, actual policies in place get us halfway there. So we would get to 25% by 2030 without any new policies. The third, then if the bottom-up actors, states and cities and businesses were to follow the lead 
many of them, not all of them, but if they were, many of them were to start to follow the lead of the leading states, we could actually probably cut that in half, get us three quarters of the way to the 50%. 50%. So states with, with, uh, with what's in place already, bottom up actors can probably take us about three quarters of the way there. That's not the whole way there. So we need both the federal government and the states, but I want to use this slide to demonstrate the importance of what's going on at a subnational level in the US. So what does then an all-in climate strategy strategy look like? And the way to think about this is that every, every actor in the US has some role to play. So the states have the ability to push ambition, set the pace of standards, building standards. California, where I'm from, uh, can actually set automobile standards. Um, uh, the national level, obviously, you have large-scale policies, policies, businesses can be doing procurement, markets, and so forth. So you have this range of different actors who can who can be taking 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 measures to make this happen. Okay, now we have been looking. We put just recently put together a study that tried to look at each of the co contributions from each of these actors to reach 50, 50 percent. So now I'll get back a little bit to some numbers. What does this mean? So these are the kinds of policies that are going to be essential to get us down to 20 to 50 percent, but also to put us on a track towards a net zero beyond that. And I'll just pull out a couple of those. I think it's it's important to see some of them that are that are kind of key. So one of them, let's phase out internal combustion engines. So that needs to be phased out in light duty vehicles by 2035. So that's part of this policy platform. 100% clean electricity by 2035, that's actually part of the Biden proposal to move forward. You can also see written here is investment in R&D. There's actually, as we think about taking action on climate, we often think, oh, let's just, let's just talk about how many solar cells we're gonna install, or how, many, how many cars we're gonna put, electric cars we're gonna put on the road. But in reality, there's an entire infrastructure around managing more renewables on the grid. That includes not just physical infrastructure, but institutional infrastructure. And so those sorts of investments and changes, changes will, be, will be important as well. Um, in buildings, we're talking about all electric appliances by 2030, only net zero buildings by 2030. In industry, we're talking about trying to reduce methane by 60% in oil and gas and reduce the leakage. And then, as I mentioned, lands are extremely important for the U.S. And let me just go then through a couple in more detail. Then the transportation sector, um, let me just get this, move something over here so I can see better. Um, so as I noted, this is both at a federal and state level. We can talk about phasing out internal combustion engines for light duty vehicles by 2035. And now what we're seeing and, um, is that with electric vehicles where we thought, oh, it's only light duty. In fact, we're seeing you can be thinking about electric vehicles in far more applications and potentially hydrogen. So now we're talking about phasing out medium and heavy duty vehicles with internal combustion engines by 2045. That's something that would be taken at the federal and state level. All actors, federal, states, cities, businesses can be engaged in procuring zero emissions vehicles targeting 100% light duty vehicle sales by 2035 and at least 30% of heavy duty vehicle sales. So the notion here is that there's a, each of the actors in this, in this space will need to be, to be moving on this if we're gonna be able to make progress. And this also gives you a sense of some of the scale. So I'm just gonna jump now to one final point, um, which is that certainly in the US, and I think in, in most countries and in many countries, climate is not the foremost issue on many people's minds. Um, in fact, people care about a much broader range of issues. They care about jobs, they care about air pollution, they care about national pride, they care about national security. All of those are, are really critical. They care about how much they're paying for energy. And so one thing that we that I think is really important and that we've emphasized that we've done our work, and I think a lot of people are starting to real to focus on is not just the climate aspects of this, but all the broader, the broader benefits, including those that are listed here. So obviously, air pollution benefits. There's increasing evidence uh, that investments in a clean economy provide more jobs than an emitting economy. So in fact, it's good for jobs. Um, there's obviously on land use, depending on how it's managed, there's increased benefits in ecosystem services and resilience. So there's a wide range of different potential benefits. 
That's not to say, though, that at the same time, there aren't some enormous societal challenges associated with this. Most notably, how to think about just transitions for folks that are involved in, in, in fossil industries, that's really critical. There's a range of energy justice issues that will arise as we start to move people, for example, off of gas in buildings and the price of gas rises, that's gonna raise a range of issues, issues as well. Um, and I think I'm at time, so I, I'll, I'll stop here, but I hope, I hope I can just, I just want to step back in, in closing comments and, and emphasize a couple of points. So first off, in the US, you're going to see the federal system has the ability to vacillate. And that being said, it's really important that we have an all-in approach. We are, in fact, taking an all-in approach in the US, and it's a pretty substantive set of activities that are happening at the subnational action. Also, like the transitions in any country, the actual technical transitions are are very impressive. There's a lot of investment. It's a rapid change, and there's a lot of investment in new technology. And that's something that's doable, but it's also something that has to be managed by this sort of all-in approach and in a way that handles handles uh, the just, just transitions. Um, but we're on track, ostensibly, and, and, and hopefully with this all-in approach, the US will, in fact, make its, make its reductions and uh, do its part as we try and limit temperature change. So with that all closed, thank you again for the chance to be here. And I'm, I'm looking forward to more comments and any discussion at the end. Um, thank, thanks very much, Leon, for that rundown of the situation in the US. And, and I think there's probably many things that strike a chord uh, with us here in Australia, um, both about the things that sometimes we are doing currently, um, but a lot of them which we uh, would dearly love to be in a position to implement at this point. So just before I introduce our final speaker, um, just reminding people, if you want to submit questions uh, using the VVox platform, do so. Uh, you can vote questions up. Uh, the list, so, so uh, we'll be working from the most popular questions uh, to, to um, cover in the Q&A session. So our final speaker um, is uh, Professor Peter Ashworth. Uh, Peter's Chair in Sustainable Energy Futures at the University of Queensland, uh, and she's also the Director of the Andrew Liveris Academy of, for Innovation and Leadership at the UQ. Uh, Peter brings over 30 years' experience working in a range of senior management consulting and research roles. And prior to joining UQ in 2016, she was a research group leader at CSIRO and in senior executive roles in global businesses. Welcome, Peter. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, 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 yep. Lots of echo here, but I'm just going to soldier on. Thank you, Mark. Lovely to see you. And um, hello to everyone in the room. And thank you, Leon, for your thoughts. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the Jagger and the Turable people from where I'm calling in from Brisbane today. Um, Leon, reflecting, I'm just going to do a little bit of primer response, I suppose, and your idea about administrations come and go, if anyone could talk to that, I think Australia, because not only do we have formal voting, but we have sort of beheadings along the way of our political ministries and so forth. So I think it's quite interesting. But just recently, we were. I was fortunate to have... Um, a guest lecture from Alexandra Cousteau talking about the work she's doing in oceans. And she talked about you know, this idea that, you know, we talk about our politicians as leaders, but she said, I actually like to think of them more as followers and they're following the public will and the public intent. And I think that's quite an interesting thing to think about when you talk about the bottom up approach and the power that, you know, I think we're, what we're seeing is as across the world and in Australia as well, this intolerance for not seeing enough action, particularly after COP. So I think political will is important. What we see in Australia is this disjunct, disjunct between what's happening at the federal level and the state. But also, as you mentioned, I think there's also this opportunity for what local governments are doing, because the opportunities that are emerging from this transition to um, increase renewable energy is the idea of, that it is good for regions and regions with agricultural base are looking for alternatives to keep them alive. So I think there are lots of synergies. The other thing that I'd like to reflect on is um, in talks sometimes with people like Alan Finkel and others that think about this, 
you know, in this one, we're actually are starting to take sources out. Up to now, we've added in, we've added additional wind, we've added additional solar, but we're at that point that we really do need to start to take out sources. And obviously coal is high emissions and gas eventually are the key ones. And so what do we need to do? I think like your study, your all in study in the next, what are we now, 21, nine years, I think the big thing is how can we build as much renewable energy as possible to start to help to those um, replace you know, the coal-fired generation. And that phasing out is going to be critical, but it is not without its challenges. Um, my work from a social license to operate perspective, I think when we're also looking at hydrogen as a new potential, um, the social license issues, I think we cannot underestimate. So while these um, renewable energy precincts, large rick scale renewable energy presents opportunities, there's lots of issues around competing land use. Um, and I see it quite regularly in the work I do even here across Queensland and other parts of Australia, where people, perhaps we might think it's marginal land, but the farmers don't. And there's a social identity with being long-term landowners or farm, hot farm, you know, beef, whatever it might be. So to actually just say that suddenly you're going to become a renewable energy farmer or you're going to host all this solar, I think we shouldn't underestimate that. And here there's a lot of discussion about hydrogen and obviously I've been involved in that, but the water becomes an issue, quite frankly, in Queensland right now we've got a deluge of water so it's not such an issue today but I think for Australia being a dry country and the predictions that we see from IPCC is, is quite challenging. Um, I think hydrogen does present some opportunities and one of the areas if we think about a sectoral approach to this obviously transport electricity but also the mining is a large part of Australia or industry manufacturing and I do think over the next 10 years, we're actually going to see um, probably more of an approach where there might be mining, you know, looking more at a sort of micro grid or, or standalone, because notwithstanding, if we think about the social license issues of upgrading transmission lines, you know, the early work by EMO was met with lots of issues. So I am optimistic and I think we are seeing, you know, the amount of Australians that are hosting, um, you know, their own solar and so forth is really important. Transport, you only have to look at the facts work that's gone out of framework for Australia's clean transport looks at many of those issues. Um, so I think there's many similarities and I think we can learn from one another on some of this, but um, it's not going to be without its challenges. And so I think, you know, the more the conversation happens across here is going to be really important. And I might just stop there and open up because I think there's many people in the room that would have views and really the idea is to have a discussion. That were just my initial thoughts and responses to your presentation, Leon. Um, thanks for that, Peter. Um, that was short and sweet, uh, and uh, we're just uh, taking our seats here um, at the front, so Frank and I. Um, so what we're doing is just uh, running uh, this from the, the VVOX system, and So, so just uh, looking at the uh, questions. So I'll just read out some of these questions, and uh, um, we can we can uh, work out who's appropriate to um, uh, comment on those. Um, I'm just noticing uh, that um, not many people have voted um, on questions, and there's not a huge number of questions here at the moment. So um, feel free to um, add to the list. So there's a question for Leon. Uh, heavy vehicles will remain on the roads for 10 to 20 years, in Australia probably more in many cases. Ma mandating heavy, heavy vehicles to be zero emissions by 2045, we'll still see um, many heavy diesel vehicles on the road after the net zero year. Uh, can we transition transport more quickly given that sort of legacy issue? Um, I mean, that's a question for the U.S., not only for the U.S. So I'll just make two comments, but I think, I mean, also others, if they want to comment, can, can comment on this as well. I think, um, first, this is a, just as a, a, a comment about the U.S. The U.S. will retain some positive emissions when it reaches net zero because, because of our land use sink and the, the size of our land use sink allows us to, to do that. Now, it depends on whether we're doing net zero CO2 or net zero CHGs. 
but nonetheless, we can expect some of that. The second thing is, though, that what you have seen in policies, in fact, this is one that we modeled at one point, are these sort of cash for clunkers. I'm not sure if you use that in Australia, but the notion of paying folks to pull vehicles off the road. I'm not sure if that's something that happens in heavy duty or not, but that's something that has definitely happened in the U.S. when it comes to light duty of vehicles. Other than that, there's no, you know, you know, that's the way that you have to pull them off is somehow there has to be an incentive to pull them off beforehand. You can also see, however, one thing that I think is really interesting, which I haven't seen enough, I mean, others have probably looked at, is what's going to be happening to fuel prices and, and sort of fuel procurement or delivery as fewer and fewer folks are, are, using, are using gasoline. So for example, studies have looked at what's gonna to happen to building natural gas in buildings. We just looked at in our own state at that. And there's potentially a substantial increase in the cost of natural gas in buildings because you now have to pay for a much, for all of the infrastructure to deliver it. At the same time, you're delivering to a much smaller set of folks. And so the cost goes up. I haven't looked at that in, in, in detail. But I would just put those points on the, on, the, on the table. I think in the U.S., this notion of trying to get them off more quickly, if there are, are alternatives based on cash or other incentives, I'm sure would be part of the package as we move forward. Thank, thanks. thanks Neil. Neil. So, so uh, you know, a, a very active policy is uh, part of the picture there. So, Frank. Uh, very quickly on Leon's point with the cash for clunkers. So it's very often very informative to look at the US to infer what might be happening in Australia. On this particular point, in terms of the, the car and vehicle sector, perhaps not so much, Leon, because we haven't got a car industry anymore. Uh, and so government's in inclination to uh, subsidize um, the deployment of new cars is, is greatly diminished because it is, there's no domestic manufacturing lobby behind it. And so that's a, that's a very substantial uh, difference that, that, that we're seeing in that regard. Thanks, Frank. Um, um, Peter, Peter, have you got any comments there or move on? When we looked at the framework, the, the subsidies that go to fossil fuels, sorry, there's a real delay and it's quite tricky to sort of manage this, but I think the subsidies provide some opportunities to where this can be. And at the moment, obviously, um, you know, changing to EVs with our current heavily um, fossil fuel intensive system isn't always going to be the ideal answer. But I think this, there are some policy moves that could happen. And I think this is where we've got to start lobbying to look for that. And I think that's what the facts group is trying to do. Yeah, I, I just I guess I would just add one more comment. I know we probably want to go to another question. But I also say technology has moved far more rapidly than we thought on transportation. So if we look back five, even five years ago in the business I'm in of modeling, Many people were talking about transportation as being the hardest place to decarbonize because there were no alternatives. Certainly 10 years ago, that was the perspective. That has entirely changed. Now we think light duty vehicles can be relatively easily electrified. Then we said, well, we can't do heavy duty. Now we're talking about doing heavy duty vehicles. So I wouldn't be surprised. I think we are, we ought to have an open mind that the rapidity of technological change could make this much easier than it seems. I'm not saying it will, but, but it certainly has changed more rapidly than most people had expected in transport, and that could continue. Yeah, and, and, and that uh, much more rapid transition seems to be a common element uh, in, in many sectors and places. Um, so the next question is, uh, has too much responsibility for the path to net zero been attributed to the national governments in both the US and Australia? And as a consequence, have state and local governments escaped too much scrutiny? Open to anyone. Um, I can comment briefly on the U.S., um, obviously not on Australia. Um, or I can comment, but probably not very well. So I'll comment on the U.S. And um, I, I'm going to put it in a more positive light. I, I, I think that's true. I, th I think if you look over time in the U.S., uh, state governments have always been taking actions. They have building standards which are ostensibly energy related or energy focused for energy security or other reasons. But those have obviously climate effects. So they have always been taking action. Cities might do zoning and so forth. But I also think it is true that in the U.S., the last four years under President Trump really galvanized the subnational movement in a way. Well, I don't know how to say this. It galvanized the subnational movement. And so now it is a force 
that I don't think is going to be relying on federal leadership anymore. And I very much agree with Peta that really the federal government follows. It follows whether technology is available. It follows what's going on at the states and the cities. It follows, certainly in democracies, follows public opinion. So I think that the states, the cities, I think the subnational actors in the U.S. after after President Trump are in a completely different posture and have a completely different perspective on their role than they did before President Trump. I think there will no longer be a reliance on the federal government to solve that. The U.S. I don't think anyone believes the federal government can do it alone. Thanks, Liam. I might jump in. Frank, you've probably got some thoughts as well on this, but I guess Australia in one way we're lucky because we're only five states and two territories. So the numbers of, of what we're looking at here. I guess the other thing that I would you would hope, and I guess I'm with optimism and hope are words that you hear a lot around here with when we're talking about emissions reduction, is that the efficiencies that can be gained if we can get a coordinated approach is what you'd aspire to, I suppose. I think in Australia we've seen a lot of leading by states and territories in these issues when we look at renewable energy and what's gone on. But in the earlier days when each state had their own um, solar feed-in tariffs and things, we saw lots of inefficiencies. So I think the more that we can galvanise that, whether it's being informed through research or through industry pressure, and I, I took away from COP and it might not be quite true, but it sort of seemed to me that there was a large business group that were trying to push some of this as well. And so that combined action, I think, is, is important when we're thinking about it. I would just like to say that, uh, you know, the notion of um, America is all in, uh, to me, is a very compelling one. You know, if, if we could arrive on this issue at a notion of Australia is all in, we would get places very quickly. On, on the specific question of states and territories, you know, I mean, action is very... Um, sort of unhomogeneous in a sense, right? It depends on the outlook of particular subnational juris uh, jurisdictions and governments at a point in time. Um, and there often has been a sense that policy in this area really isn't for state and, uh, and, and territory governments, but really for the feds, right? And so there's been a sense of waiting for the federal government to do this, uh, that or the other. And so I think we've wasted a lot of time in that regard. Yeah, but just to add one other comment on this. I think I didn't, I, I sort of forgot to mention in my presentation, but I think when we think about this sort of all in approach, there's there's one lens of it is this notion of vacillation by, by any of actually the entities. You know, I think subnet can be businesses can change their CDOs and so forth, and, and states can change their governors. So there's that. But at the same time, the other thing that's critically important is that you actually need this even if everyone's on the same page. You know, states may be involved, uh, local jurisdictions will be do, doing zoning, states may be involved in actually managing parts of the electricity grid. Um, and so there's actually a need for this collaboration. And there's already just a need for the collaboration to implement anyway, irrespective of this notion of sort of backstopping one another. This collaboration is actually critical to make it work effectively. Thanks, Leon. Thanks, Leon. So we may have one or two questions to go because uh, we're just running out of time because of the late start. But um, uh, just to, again for anyone, um, is anyone prepared to sort of make a comment on the influence of the strategic competition between China and the US and potentially the relationships of Australia and China on this uh, transition that we're on? I didn't get that, Mark. Um, China-US competition and Australia versus China relationships and the implications. I only sort of got that. Um, I mean, I, I can just, yeah, I'm not sure if I can comment. I, if I only sort of understood it, Mark, but I, I can say that, um, that I do think that the US-China anna announcement was an important announcement at the COP. And I, there's questions about how much in specific was nailed down um, in that. But I do think that even in a time of sort of intense competition in other domains, uh, it does look like there may now be some 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 space for collaboration in the climate space from the, between the US and China. If you allow me very briefly, I mean, uh, Leon, the, of course, 
uh, you will know the, the Australia-China relationship at the national level uh, has been a very fraught one, uh, in particular in, in, in very recent years, very, very difficult. But when you look at the big picture in the long term, of course, you know, there's a very strong trade, and in particular resource uh, trade and also energy trade between the two countries. And so, um, you know, cooperation in the pathway to decarbonisation is actually really essential. Uh, and will undoubtedly provide uh, enormous economic opportunity, both in terms of innovation uh, and the trade investment relationship between the two countries. So when you look at uh, that bilateral relationship, Australia-China in this case, from the point of view of going to net zero, um, then working together to the extent that is possible will surely be uh, of, of benefit. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. And, and Peter, Peter, any comments? Any comments? Whoops. Frank, I think, you know, when you look at the out to 2060, what China's put on um, on their sort of aspirations, you know, I've got a PhD student in China who's sending me lots of information around, you know, they're very keen to lift the education and um, those parts around what to do with the broader. And I, and I think they see that there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration. So I think through academia and some of those shared technology breakthroughs, um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity regardless um, of the geopolitics that's playing out at that loud, larger scale. I think there is still opportunity and would agree with Frank. Yeah, um, okay. And so, so I think we've got, we, we'd have to draw it to a close. Okay. So, um, well, I just want to uh, draw this to a close and again, apologise for the late start. So we, we just have to cut the Q&A just so we get back on time for the, the rest of the program today. Um, but I'd just uh, like to thank uh, all three of our, our speakers, uh, Frank, Leon and Peter, uh, for their uh, presentations and for responding to questions. Uh, and, and at least Frank will be here to um, uh, be asked questions of subsequently. Um, but thanks very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.